Chapter Twenty Six of Craddock Knoll: A Tale of the New Forest, Volume One, by Richard Doddridge Blackmore. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter Twenty Six. At this melancholy time, John Rosedew had quite enough to do without any burden of fresh anxieties about his own pet Amy. Nevertheless, that burden was added not by dr hutton's vague questions although they helped to impose it but by the father's own observation of his darling's strange condition can it be he asked himself and often longed to ask her as he saw only lilies where roses had been and little hands trembling at breakfast time can it be that this child of mine loved the poor boy clayton and is wasting away in sorrow for him is that the reason why she will not meet Craddock, nor Craddock meet her, and she trembles at his name? And then that book which Aunt Doxy made her throw on the kitchen fire, very cruel I now see it was of my very good sister Eudoxia, though at first I did not think so. That book I know was poor Clayton's, for I have seen it in his hand. Well, if it truly is so, there is nothing to be done except to be unusually kind to her and trust to time for the cure and give her plenty of blackcurrant jam these ideas he imparted to the good aunt doxy who delivered some apophthegms which john did not want to listen to but undertook whatever should happen to be down upon amy sharply she knew all about her tonsils and her uvula and all that stuff and she did not want john's advice though she had never had a family and thanked god heartily for it on monday when the funeral came to nolhurst churchyard john rosedew felt his heart give way and could not undertake it at the risk of deeply offending sir cradock whose nerves that day were of iron he passed the surplice to his curate mr pell of rushford and begged him with a sad slow smile to do the duty for him Sir Craddock Knoll frowned and coloured, and then bowed low with an icy look, when he saw the change which had been made, and John Rosedew fall in as a mourner. People said that from that day the old friendship was dissevered. John, for his part, could not keep his eyes from the nook of the churchyard, where among the yew-trees stood, in the bitterness of anguish, he who had not asked, nor been asked, to attend as mourner craddock bowed his head and wept for now his tears came freely and prayed the one almighty father who alone has mercy not to take his misery from him but to take him from it when the mould was cast upon the coffin black weena came between people's legs gave a cry and jumped in after it thinking to retrieve her master like a stick from the water she made such a mournful noise in the grave and whimpered and put her head down and wondered why no one said weena dear that all the schoolgirls burst out sobbing having had apples from clayton lately and octavius pell the great cricketer wanted something soft for his throat that evening when all was over and the grave heaped snugly up and it was time to think of other things and begin to wonder at sorrow john rosedew went to sir cradock knoll not only as a fellow mourner and a friend of ancient days but as a minister of christ it had cost john many struggles and what with his sense of worldly favours school-day friendship delicacy he could scarce tell what to make of it till he just went down on his knees and prayed and the learned man learned his duty sir cradock turned his head away as if he did not want him john held out his hand and said nothing mr rosedew i am surprised to see you and yet john this is kind of you john hoped that he only said mr rosedew because the footman was lingering and he tried not to feel the difference craddock you know what i am as well as i know what you are fifty years my dear fellow fifty years of friendship yes john I remember when I was twelve years old and you fought Sam Cockings for me. And, Craddock, I thrashed him fairly. You know I thrashed him fairly. 
They said I got his head under the form, but you know it was all a lie. How I do hate lies. I believe it began that day. If so, the dislike is subjective. Perhaps I ought to reconsider it. John, I know nothing in your life which you ought to reconsider, except what you are doing now. Sir Craddock Knoll began the combat, because he felt that it must be waged, and perhaps he knew in that beginning that he had the weaker cause. Craddock, I am doing nothing which is not my simple duty. When I see those I love in the deepest distress, can I help siding with them? Upon that principle, or want of it, you might espouse as a duty the cause of any murderer. The old man shuddered, and his voice shook as he whispered that last word. As yet he had not worked himself up, nor been worked up by others, to the black belief which made the living lost beyond the dead. I am sure I don't know what I might do, said John Rosedew simply, but what I am doing now is right, and in your heart you know it. Come, Craddock, as an old man now, and one whom God has visited, forgive your poor, your noble son, who never will forgive himself. But for one word in that speech, John Rosedew would perhaps have won his cause, and reconciled son and father. My noble son, indeed, John, a very noble thing he has done. Shall I never hear the last of his nobility? And who ever called my Clayton noble? You have been unfair throughout, John Rosedew, most unfair and blind to the merits of my more loving, more simple-hearted, more truly noble boy, I tell you. Mr. Rosedew, at such a time, could not, of course, contest the point, could not tell the bereaved old man that it was he himself who had been unfair. And when, asked Sir Craddock, getting warmer, when did you know my poor boy Violet stick up for his political opinions of his own at the age of twenty, want to drain tenants' cottages, and pretend to be better and wiser than his father? And when have you known Craddock do, at any rate, the latter? Ever since he got that scholarship, that Scotland thing, at Oxford. Sir Craddock knew the name well enough, as every Oxford man does. He has been perfectly insufferable. Such arrogance, such conceit, such airs, and he only got it by a trick. Poor Viley ought to have had it. John Rosedew tried to control himself, but the gross untruth and injustice of that last accusation were a little too much for him. Perhaps, Sir Craddock Noel, you will allow that I am a competent judge of the relative powers of the two boys, who knew all they did know from me, and from no one else. Of course I know you are a competent judge, only blinded by partiality. John allowed even that to go by. Without any question of preference, simply as a lover of literature, I say that Clayton had no chance with him, in a greek examination in latin he would have run him close you know i always said so even before they went to college i was surprised at the time that they mentioned clayton even as a second to him and grieved i dare say deeply grieved if the truth were told it is below me to repel mean little accusations come john rosedew said sir cradock magnanimously and liberally I can forgive you for being quarrelsome, even at such a time as this. It always was so, and I suppose it always will be. Today I am not fit for much, though perhaps you do not know it. Thinking so little of my dead boy, you are surprised that I should grieve for him. I should be surprised indeed if you did not. God knows even I have grieved deeply, as for a son of my own. Shake hands, John. You are a good fellow, the best fellow in the world. Forgive me for being petulant. You don't know how my heart aches. After that, it was impossible to return for the moment to Craddock Knoll. But the next day, John renewed the subject, and at length obtained a request from the father that his son should come to him. By this time, Craddock hardly knew when he was doing anything, and when he was doing nothing. He seemed to have no regard for anyone, 
no concern about anything least of all for himself even his love for amy rosedew had a pall thrown over it and lay upon the trestles the only thing he cared at all for was his father's forgiveness let him get that and then go away and be seen no more among them he could not think or feel surprise or fear or hope for anything he could only tell himself all day long that if god were kind he would kill him a young life wrecked so utterly wrecked and through no fault of his own unless as some begin to dream we may not slay for luxury unless we have but a limited right to destroy our father's property sir cradock it has been stated cared a great deal more for his children than he did for his ancestors he had not been wondering through his sorrow what the world would say of him what it would think of the knolls he had a little too much self-respect to care a fig for fool's tongue now he sat in his carved oak chair expecting his only son and he tried to sit upright but the flatness of his back was gone never to return and the shoulder blade showed through his coat like a spoon left under the tablecloth still he appeared a stately man not one easily bowed by fortune or at least not apt to acknowledge it young cradock entered his father's study with a flush on his cheeks which had been so pale and his mind made up for endurance but his wits going round like a swirl of leaves he could not tell what he might say or do he began to believe that he had shot his father and to wonder whether it hurt him much trying in vain to master his thoughts he stood with his quivering hands clasped hard and his chin upon his breast so perhaps adrastus stood adrastus son of gordias before the childless croesus and the simple words are these after this there came the lydians carrying the corpse and behind it followed the slayer and standing there before the corpse he gave himself over to croesus stretching forth his hands commanding to slay him upon the corpse telling both his own former stress and how upon the top of that he had destroyed his cleanser nor was his life now livable croesus having heard these things though being in so great a trouble of the hearth has compassion on adrastus and says to him but adrastus son of gordias son of midas this man i say who had been the slayer of his womb brother and slayer of him that cleansed him when there was around the grave a quietude from men feeling that he was of all men whom he had ever seen the most weighed down with trouble kills himself dead upon the tomb but the father now was not like croesus the generous-hearted lydian although the man who stood before him was not a renegade from phrygia but the son of his own loins the father did not look at him but kept his eyes fixed on the window as though he knew not any were near him then the son could wait no more but spoke in a hollow trembling voice father i am come as you ordered yes i will not keep you long perhaps you want to go out shooting he was about to say but could not be quite so cruel i only wish to settle matters that we may meet no more oh father my own father for god's sake if there be a god don't speak to me like that sir i shall take it as a proof that you are still a gentleman which at least you used to be if you will henceforth address me as sir cradock nowell a title which soon will be your own father look me in the face and ask me then i will sir cradock nowell still looked forth the heavily tinted window his son his only his grief-worn son was kneeling at his side unable to weep too proud to sob with the sense of deep wrong rising if the father once had looked at him nature must have conquered mr noel i have only admitted you that we might treat of business allow me to forget the face of a fratricide perhaps murderer cradock noel fell back heavily for he had risen from his knees 
the crown of his head crashed the glass of a picture his blood showered down his pale face he never even put his hand up to feel what was the matter he said nothing not a syllable but stood there and let the room go round how his mother must have wept if she was looking down from heaven the old man having all the while a crude dim sense of outrunning his heart gave the youth time to recover himself if it were a thing worth recovering now as to our arrangements the subject i wish to speak about i only require your consent to the terms i propose until in the natural course of events you succeed to the family property what family property sir craddock's head was dizzy still and bleeding had done him good why of course the nolhurst property all these entailed estates to which you are now sole heir I will never touch one shilling nor step upon one acre of it Under your mother's that is to say under my marriage settlement Continued sir Craddock in the same tone as if his son were only bantering you are at once entitled to the sum of fifty thousand pounds invested in three per cent consuls Which would have been I mean which was meant for younger children This sum the trustees will be prepared do you think I will touch it? Am I a thief as well as a murderer? I shall also make arrangements for securing to you until my death an income of five thousand pounds per annum This you can draw for quarterly and the checks will be countersigned by my steward. Mr. Garnet Of course lest I should forge once for all hear me sir Craddock Noel so help me the god who has now forsaken me who has turned my life to death and made my own father curse me Every word of yours is a curse I say so help me that God if there be one to help as well as to smite a man Till you crave my pardon upon your knees as I have craved yours this day I will never take one yard of your land I will never call myself Noel or own you again as my father God knows I am very unlucky and little but you have shown yourself less and some day you will know it in the full strength of his righteous pride he walked for the first time like a man since he leaped that deadly hedge From that moment a change came over him There was nothing to add to his happiness, but something to rouse his manhood The sense of justice the sense of honor that flower and crown of justice Forbade him henceforth to sue and be shy and bemoan himself under hedges from that day forth he was a man visited of God and humbled but facing ever his fellow men and not ashamed of affliction End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 of Craddock Knoll a tale of the new forest volume 1 by Richard Doddridge Blackmore this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lynn Thompson. Chapter 27 With an even step and no frown on his forehead, nor glimpse of a tear in his eyes, young Craddock walked to his own little room, his nest, as he used to call it, where pipes and books and Oxford prints, no ballet girls, however, and not so very many hunters and whips and foils and boxing gloves cum multis aliis quae nunc describere longum est et qui non dicta long ago were handled more often than dusted all these things except one pet little pipe which he was now come to look for and which viley had given him a year ago when they swapped pipes on their birthday like diomed and the brave lycian all the rest were things of a bygone age to be thought of no more for the present but dreamed of perhaps on a christmas eve when the air is full of luxury caring but little for any of them although he had loved them well until they seemed to injure him craddock proceeded with great equanimity to do a very foolish thing which all good badly for the success of a young man just preparing to start for himself in the world He poured the entire contents of his purse 
into a little cedar tray then packed all the money in paper rolls with a neatness which rather astonished him and sealed each roll with his amethyst ring then he put them into a little box of some rare and beautiful palm wood which had been his mother's laid his cheque-book beside them for he had been allowed a banking account long before he was of age and placed upon that his gold watch and chain and trinkets the amethyst ring itself his diamond studs and other jewelry even a locket which had contained two little sheaves of hair bound together with golden thread but from which he first removed and packed in silver paper the fair hair of his mother this last with the pipe which clayton had given him and the empty purse made by amy's fingers were all he meant to carry away besides the clothes he wore after locking the box he rang the bell and begged the man who answered it to send old hogstaff to him that faithful servant from whom he had learned so many lessons of infancy came tottering along the passage with his old eyes dull and heavy for job had gloried in those two brothers and loved them both as the children of his elder days and now one of them was gone for ever in the height of his youth and beauty and a whisper was in the household that the other would not stay of him whom job had always looked upon as his future master for he meant to outlive the present sir cradock as he had done the one before him he had just been scoring upon his fingers all the things he had taught him to whistle spankadillo while he drummed it with his knuckles to come to the pantry door and respond to the who's there a grenadier shouldering a broomstick to play on the jew's harp with variations an old friend and a bottle to give him and then to uncork the fictitious bottle with the pop of his forefinger out of his mouth and to decant it carefully with a part of his gurgling cheeks after all that how could he believe master crad could ever forsake him now mr hogstaff's legs were getting like the ripe pods of a scarlet runner although he did not run much here they stuck in and there they stuck out abnormally in either case his body began to come forward as if warped at the small of the back and his honest face though he drank but his duty was septembered with many a vintage and yet with the keenness of love and custom he saw at once what the matter was as he looked up at the young master oh master crad dear master crad whatever are you going to do don't for good now don't i beg on you hearken now do we hearken to an old man for a minute and he caught him by both arms to stop him with his tremulous wrinkled hands oh hoggy dear kind hoggy you are about the only one left to care about me now no don't you say that master crad don't you say that whatever you do whoever tell you that tell a lie sir it was only last night mrs toaster and cook and mrs o'gayan the irishwoman was round the fire boiling and they cried a deal more than they boiled i do assure you they did sir and mr stote he come in with some rabbits and he went on like mad and the maids so sorry every one of them they can't be content with their mourning sir i do assure you they can't oh don't he do no harm to yourself don't he mr craddock sir no hoggy said craddock taking his hands you need not fear that now of me i have had very wicked thoughts but god has helped me over them henceforth i am resolved to bear my trouble like a man it is the part of a dog to run when the hoot begins behind him now take this little box and this key and give them yourself to sir craddock knoll it is the last favour i shall ask of you i am going away my dear old friend don't keep me now for i must go only give me your good wishes and see that they mind poor caldo and whatever they say of me behind my back you won't believe it job hogstaff will you job hogstaff had never been harder put to it in all his seventy years 
Then, as he stood at the open door to see the last of his favourite, he thought of the tall, dark woman's words so many years ago. A bonny pair ye have got, but ye'll have no luck of them. Take the word of threescore year, ye'll never get no luck of them. Craddock turned aside from his path to say good-bye to Caldo. It would only take just a minute, he thought, and of course he should never see him again. So he went to that snuggest and sweetest of kennels, and in front of it sat the king of dogs. The varieties of canine are as manifold and distinct as those of human nature, but the dog, be he saturnine or facetious, sociable or contemplative, mercurial or melancholic, is quite sure to be one thing, true and loyal ever. Can we, who are less than the dogs of the infinite, say as much of ourselves to him? Now Caldo, who has been implied, if not expressed before, was a setter of large philosophy and rare reflective power. I mean, of course, theoretical, more than practical philosophy, as any dog would soon have discovered who tried to snatch a bone from him. Moreover, he had some originality, and a turn for satire. He would sit sometimes by the hour, nodding his head impressively, and blinking first one eye and then the other, watching and considering the doings of his fellow dogs. How fashionably they yawned and stretched, in a mode they had learned from a pointer, who was proud of his teeth and vertebrae. How they hooked up their tails for a couple of joints, and then let them fall at a right angle, having noticed that fashion in ladies' bustles, when they came on a Sunday to talk to them. How they crawled on their stomachs to get a pat, as a provincial mare does for knighthood. How they sniffed at each other's door, with an eye to the rotten bones under the straw, as we all smell about for the wealthy. How their courtesy to one another flowed from their own convenience. These, and a thousand other dog tricks, Caldo, dwelling apart, observed, but did not condemn, for he felt that they were his own. Now he hushed his bark of joy, and looked up wistfully at his master, for he knew by the expression of that face all things were not as they ought to be. Why had Weena snapped at him so, and avoided his society, though he had always been so good to her, and even thought of an alliance? Why did his master order him home that dull night in the covert, when he was sure he had done no harm? Above all, what meant that moving blackness he had seen through the trees only yesterday, when the other dogs, muffs as they were, expected a regular battue, and came out strong at their kennel doors, and barked for young Clayton to fetch them. So he looked up now in his master's face, and guessed that it meant a long farewell, perhaps a farewell for ever. He took a fond look into his eyes, and his own pupils told great volumes. Then he sat up, and begged for a minute or two, with a most beseeching glance, to share his master's fortunes, though he might have to steal his livelihood, and never get any shooting. Seeing that this could never be, he planted his forepaws on Craddock's breast, though he felt that it was a liberty, and nestled his nose right under his cheek, and wanted to keep him ever so long. Then he howled with a low, enduring despair, as the footfall he loved grew fainter. Looking back sadly now and then at the tranquil home of his childhood, whose wings and gables and depths of stone were grand in the autumn sunset, Craddock Knoll went his way toward the simple rectory. He would say good-bye there to Uncle John and kind Aunt Doxy. Miss Rosedew the younger, of course, would avoid him, as she had done ever since. But suddenly he could not resist the strange desire to see once more that fatal, miserable spot, the bidental of his destiny. So he struck into a side-path leading to the deep and bosky covert. The long shadows fell from the pale birch stems, the hollies looked black in the sloping light, and the brown leaves fluttered down here and there as the cold wind set the trees shivering. Only six days ago, only half an hour further into the dusk, 
he had slain his own twin brother he crawled up the hedge through the very same gap for he could not leap it now his back ached with weakness his heart with despair as he stayed himself by the same hazel branch which had struck his gun at the muzzle then he shivered as the trees did and his hair like the brown leaves rustled as he knelt and prayed that his brother's spirit might appear there and forgive him hoping and fearing to find it there he sidled down into the dark wood and with his heart knocking hard against his ribs forced himself to go forward all at once his heart stood still and every nerve of his body went creeping for he saw a tall white figure kneeling where his brother's blood was kneeling never moving the hands together as in prayer the face as wan as immortality the black hair if it were hair falling straight as a pall drawn back from an alabaster coffin head the power of the entire form was not of earth nor heaven but as of the intermediate state when we know not we are dead yet Craddock could not think nor breathe the whole of his existence was frozen up in awe It showed him in the after time when he could think about it the ignorance the insolence of dreaming that any human state is quit of human fear While he gazed in dread to move not knowing his limbs would refuse him with his whole life swallowed up in gazing at the world beyond the grave the tall white figure threw its arms up into the darkening sky rose and vanished instantly what do you think craddock noel did we all know what he ought to have done he ought to have walked up calmly with measured yet rapid footsteps and his eyes and wits well about him and investigated everything instead of that he cut and ran as hard as he could go and i know i should have done the same thing and i believe more than half of you would unless you were too much frightened he would never turn back upon living man but our knowledge of hades is limited we pray for angels around our bed if they came we should have nightmare craddock going at a desperate pace with a handsome pair of legs which had recovered their activity kicked up something hard and bright from a little dollop of leaves caught it in his hand like a tennis ball and leaped the hedge uno impetu away he went without stopping to think through the splashy sides of the spire bed almost as fast and quite as much frightened as rufus hutton's mare when he got well out into the chase he turned and began to laugh at himself but a great white owl flapped over a furze bush and away went craddock again the light had gone out very suddenly as it often does in october and craddock whose wind was uncommonly good felt it his duty to keep good hours at the rectory so with the bright thing whatever it was poked anywhere into his pocket he came up the drive at early tea-time and got a glimpse through the window of amy couldn't have been amy at any rate he said to himself in extinction of some very vague ideas i defy her to come at the pace i have done no no it must have been in answer to my desperate prayer amy was gone though her cup was there when craddock entered the drawing-room well he thought how hard-hearted she is but it cannot matter now much though i never believed she would be so being allowed by his kind entertainers to do exactly as he pleased poor craddock had led the life of a hermit more than that of a guest among them he had taken what little food he required in the garret he had begged for or carried it with him into the woods where most of his time was spent of course all this was very distressing to the hospitable heart of miss doxy but her brother john would have it so for so he had promised Craddock He could understand the reluctance of one who feels himself under a ban to meet his fellow creatures hourly and know that they all are thinking of him So it came to pass that miss Eudoxia who now sat alone in the drawing-room was surprised as well as pleased at the entrance of their refugee 
as he hesitated a moment in doubt of his reception she ran up at once took both his hands and kissed him on the forehead oh craddock my dear boy this is kind of you most kind indeed to come and tell me at once of your success i need not ask i know by your face the first bit of colour i have seen in your poor cheeks this many a day that's because i have been running miss rosedew miss rosedew indeed and now craddock aren't you doxia if you please or aunt doxy with all my heart now he used to call her so to tease her in the happy days gone by and she loved to be teased by him her pet and idol dear aunt eudoxia tell me truly do you think i can hardly ask you think what craddock oh my poor craddock oh don't be like that not that i did i don't mean that but that it was possible for me to have done it on purpose done what on purpose craddock why of course that horrible horrible thing on purpose craddock my poor innocent only let me hear any one dream of it and if i don't come down upon them an undignified sentence that of aunt doxy's as well as a most absurd one how long has she been in the habit of hearing people dream someone not only dreams it someone actually believes that i did it so the low wretch the despicable who my own father i will not repeat what miss rosedew said when she recovered from her gasp because her language was stronger than becomes an elderly lady and the sister of a clergyman not to mention the countess of driddledrum and dromore who must have been wholly forgotten then you don't think aunt eudoxia that that uncle john would believe it what my brother john surely you know better than that my dear nor nor perhaps not even cousin amy amy indeed i do believe that child is perfectly mad i can't make her out at all she is so contradictory she cries half the night i am sure of that and she does not care for her school though she goes there and her flowers she won't look at seeing that craddock's countenance fell more and more at all this miss rosedew who had long suspected where his heart was dwelling told him a thing to cheer him up which she had declared she would never tell darling amy is you know a very odd girl indeed sometimes when something happens very puzzling and perplexing some great visitation of providence amy becomes so dreadfully obstinate i mean she has such delightful faith that we are obliged to listen to her and she is quite sure to be right in the end though at the moment perhaps we laugh at her and yet she is so shy you can never get at her heart except by forgetting what you are about well we got at it somehow this afternoon and you should have heard what she said her beautiful great eyes flashed upon us like the rock that was struck and gushed like it before she ended can we dare to think she cried that our god is asleep like baal that he knows not when he has chastened his children beyond what they can bear i know that he who is now so trampled and crushed of heaven is not tried thus for nothing he shall rise again more pure and large and fresh from the hand of god and do what lucky men rarely think of the will of his creator and when john and i looked at her she fell away and cried terribly craddock was greatly astonished it seemed so unlike young amy to be carried away in that style but her comfort and courage struck root in his heart and her warm faith thawed his despair still he saw very little chance at present of doing anything but starving how wonderfully good you all are to me but i can't talk about it though i shall think of it as long as i live i am going away to-night aunt doxy but i must first see uncle john of course miss rosedew was very angry and proved it to be quite impossible that craddock should leave them so but before long her good sense prevailed and she saw that it was for the best while he stayed there he must either persist to shut himself up in solitude 
or wander about in desert places and never look with any comfort on the face of man so she went with him to the door of the book room and left him with none but her brother john rosedew sat in his little room with only one candle to light him and the fire gone out as usual his books lay all around him even his best loved treasures but his heart was not among them the grief of the old though not wild and passionate as a young man's anguish is perhaps more pitiable because more slow and hopeless the young tree rings to the keen pruning hook the old tree groans to the grating saw but one will blossom and bear again while the other gapes with canker none of his people had heard the rector quote any greek or latin for a length of time unprecedented when a sweet and playful mind like his has taken to mope and be earnest the effect is far more sad and touching than a stern man's melancholy ironworks out of blast are dreary but the family hearth moss grown is woeful uncle john leaped up very lightly from his brooding rather than reading and shook craddock knoll by the hand as if he never would let him go all the time looking into his face by the light of a composite candle it was only to know how he had fared and john read his face too truly then as craddock turned away not wanting to make much of it john came before him with sadness and love and his blue eyes glistened softly my boy my boy was all he could say or think for a very long time then craddock told him without a tear a sigh or even a comment but with his face as pale as could be and his breath coming heavily all that his father had said to him and all that he meant to do through it and so uncle john he concluded rising to start immediately here i go to seek my fortune such as it will and must be good-bye my best and only friend i am ten times the man i was yesterday and shall be grander still to-morrow he tried to pop off like a lively court but john rosedew would not have it young man don't be in a hurry it strikes me that i want a pipe and it also strikes me that you will smoke one with me craddock was taken aback by the novelty of the situation he had never dreamed that uncle john could under any possible circumstances ask him to smoke a pipe he knew well enough that the rector smoked a sacrificial pipe to morpheus in a room of his own upstairs only one while chewing the cud of all he had read that day but mr rosedew had always discouraged as elderly smokers do any young aspirants to the mystic hierophancy it is not a vow to be taken rashly for the vow is irrevocable except with men of no principle and now he was to smoke there he a mere bubble-blowing boy to smoke in the middle of deepest books to fumigate a manuscript containing a lifeful of learning which john could no more get on with and oh miss eudoxia to make the hall smell and the drawing-room the oxymoron overcame him and he took his pipe john rosedew had filled it judiciously and quite as a matter of course he filled his own in the self-same manner with a digital skill worthy of an ancient fox trying on a foxglove all the time john was shyly wondering at his own great force of character now said john rosedew still keeping it up i have a drop of very old shedom schnapps i think or something of which i want your opinion crab my boy i want your opinion before we import any more i am no judge of that sort of thing it is so long since i was at oxford without more ado he went some whither after lighting craddock's yard of clay which the young man burnt his fingers about for he wouldn't let the old man do it and came back like a bacchanal with a square blackjack beneath his arm and jenny after him wondering whether they had not prayed that morning enough against the devil it was a good job miss amy was out of the way the old cat was bewitched that was certain as well as her dear good master miss doxy was happy in knowing not that she was called the old cat in the kitchen 
End of chapter 27chapter twenty eight of craddock knoll a tale of the new forest volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox org recording by lynn thompson craddock knoll a tale of the new forest volume one by richard doddridge blackmore chapter twenty eight now craddy my dear dear boy said uncle john when things had been done with lemon and cold water and all that wherein discussion so utterly beats description you know me too well to suppose that i wish to pass things lightly i know well enough that you will look the hard world full in the face and so should i do in your case all i wish is that you should do it not with spite or bile or narrowness but broadly as a christian it is hard to talk about that now said Craddock inhaling charity and puffing away all acrimony Uncle John I hope I may come to it as my better spirit returns to me I Hope it indeed and believe it crad. I don't see how it can be otherwise With a young man of your breadth of mind and solid faith to help you an empty lad who snaps up stuff because he thinks it's fine and garbles it into garbage would become an utter infidel under what you have suffered with you i believe it will be otherwise i believe you will be enlarged and purified by sorrow the night which makes the guiding star so much the clearer to us john rosedew was drinking no shedom allow me to explain though pretending rare enjoyment of it and making craddock drink a little because his heart was down so after they had talked a pipeful longer not great weighty sentiments but a deal of kindly stuff the young fellow got up quietly and said now uncle john i must go my boy i can trust you anywhere after what you have been telling me of human nature i know nothing except for john thought he did know something from my own little experience i find great thoughts in the greek philosophers but somehow they are too general and too little genial one thing i know we far more often mistrust than trust unwisely and now i can trust you craddock in the main you will stand upright stop my boy you must have a scrip i was saving it for your birthday you don't despise me i hope said craddock you don't think me a coward for running away so after what has happened to-day i should go mad if i stopped here not that that would matter much only that if it were so i should be sure to do it john rosedew had no need to ask what he meant by the last two words for the hollow voice told him plainly but for him it is likely enough that it would have been done ere this at any rate in the first horror his hand alone had prevented it the parson trembled at the idea but thought best not to dwell upon it Reformidare mortem est animi pusillanimi, but reformidare vitam is ten times worse because impious. Therefore, in your case, my boy, it is utterly impossible, as well as ignoble, towards us who love you so. Remember that you will break at least two old hearts you owe some duty to, if you allow your own to be broken. And now for your viaticum see how you have relieved me while you liveth beneath hymetian beams in the goods of tyre and cyprus i even i your godfather knew not what to give you the thought has been vexing me for months and now what a simple solution you shall have it in the original dross to pay the toll on the appian road at least the southwestern railway fixed to athens i thought it would be or even as eels to Copais, and now surveys iturum caesarem i believe it is the twenty-first page of my manuscript such as it is upon the spellian elements after searching in three or four drawers for he was rather astray at the moment though generally he could put his hand even in the dark upon any particular one of his ten thousand books 
he came upon the Sabellian treaties written on backs of letters on posters on puffing circulars even on visiting cards and cast away tradesmen's tickets and there at the twenty-first page or deltis lay a fifty pound bank of england note with some very tough roots arranged diamond wise on the back and arrows and hyphens and asterisks flying about thickly between them these he copied off in a moment on a piece of old hat lining and then triumphantly waved the banknote in the air it was not often poor uncle john got hold of so much money too bitterly knew aunt doxy how large was the mesh of his purse while craddock gazed with great admiration john rosedew with his fingers upon his lips and looking half ashamed of himself went to a cupboard whose doors half open gave a glimpse of countless sermons from among them he drew a wide mouthed bottle of leeches and set it upon the table then he pulled out the stopper unplugged it and lo from a hole in the cork fell out two sovereigns and a half one as this money rolled on the table john could not help chuckling a little ha good sister eudoxia have i overreached thee again double precaution there you see crad she has a just horror of my sermons and she runs at the sight of a leech no monsieur acutem to be sure not a word about it crad that asylum is inviolable and sempitern i hope i shall put more there next week craddock took the money at once with the deepest gratitude but no great fuss about it for he saw how bitterly that good man would feel it if he were small enough to refuse i shall not dwell upon their good-bye as we have had enough valediction only craddock promised to write from london as soon as he could give an address there then leaving sadness behind him carried a deal of it with him only something must yet be recounted which befell him in nolhurst and this is the first act of it while he was in his garret packing a little bag of necessaries forced upon him by miss doxy from john's wardrobe and her own almost indiscriminately and while she was pulling and struggling upstairs with john and jemima and jenny for she would have made craddock if she could carry the entire house with him he stowing some things in his pocket felt what he had caught up so hastily while flying out of the wood he examined it by candlelight and became at once intent upon it it had lain beneath a drift of dead leaves backed by a scraggy branch whence anything short of a grand skedaddle would never have dislodged it and yet it was a great deal too pretty to be treated in that way craddock could not help admiring it though he shuddered and felt some wild hopes vanish as he made out the meaning it was a beautiful gold bracelet light and of first-rate workmanship harmonious too with its purpose and of elegant design the lower half was a strong soft chain in the fabric of trichinopoly which bends like the skin of a snake the front and face showed a strong right arm gauntleted yet entirely dependent upon the hand of a lady no bezeling no jewel whatever except that a glorious rose-shaped pearl hung as in contest between them craddock wondered for some little time what could be the meaning of it then he knew that it was clayton's offering to the beloved amy no doubt could remain any longer when he saw in the hollow of the back the proposed inscription penciled rosa de Bita, for the dead gold of the lady's palm rosa de Dita for the burnished gold of the cavalier's high pressure with ingenious love to help him he made it out in a moment a rose dew now a rose true that was what it came to if you took it in punster fashion just one of poor viley's conceits craddock had no time to follow it out for miss eudoxia then came in with a parcel as big as a feather bed of comforters wrappers and eatables but after he had left the house he began to think about it in the little path across the green to the village churchyard he concluded that amy must have been in the wood that fatal evening she must have come to meet clayton there and yet it was not like her facts however are facts as sure as eggs are eggs 
though our knowledge makes no great advance through either of those aphorisms but a growing sense of injury though he had no right to feel injured however it might be this sense had kept him from asking for amy or leaving the flirt a good-bye he entered the quiet churchyard with the moon rising over the tombstones a mass of shadow cast by the great tower and some epitaphs pushing well into the night like the names which get poked into history the wavering glance of the diffident moon uncertain yet what the clouds meant slipped along the buttressed walls and tried to hold on at the angles the damp corner where the tower stood forth and the south porch ran out to look at it drew back like a ghost who was curtsying and declining all further inquiry green slime was about like the sludge of a river and a hundred sacred memories growing weary and rheumatic had stopped their ears with lichen Craddock came in at the rickety swing style and caring no shadow for ghost or ghostess Although he had run away so took the straight course to the old black doorway and on to the heart of the churchyard For he must say good-bye to Clayton all Nowelhurst still admired that path But those who had paved and admired it first were sleeping on either side of it the pavement now was overlapped under tucked and crannied Full of holes where lobworms lived and came out after a thunderstorm and three-cornered dips that looked glazed in wet weather but scurfy and clammy in drought and some of the flags stole away and gave under as if they too wanted burial while others jerked up and asserted themselves as superior to some of the tombstones there in the dark no mortal with any respect for his grandfather nor even a ghost with unbeveled souls could go many steps without tripping who will be astonished then when i say that the lightest and loveliest foot that ever tripped in the new forest not only tripped but stumbled there at the very corner where the sidewalk comes in and the shade of the tower was deepest smack from behind a hideous sarcophagus fell into craddock's arms the most beautiful thing ever seen if he had not caught her she must have cut the very sweetest face in the world into great holes like the pavement Stunned for a moment and then so abroad that she could not think nor even speak Speak nor think I would have said if Amy had been masculine She lay in Craddock's trembling arms and never wondered where she was Craddock forgot all despair for the moment and felt uncommonly lively it was the sweetest piece of comfort sent to him yet from heaven Afterwards he always thought that his luck turned from that moment Perhaps it did although most people would laugh who knew him afterwards Presently Amy recovered and was wroth with herself and everybody Ruddier than a borsalt rose she fell back against the tombstone. Oh Amy said Craddock retiring I have known it long even you are turned against me i turned against you mr noel what right have you to say that of me no right to say anything amy and scarcely a right to think anything only i have felt it then i wouldn't give much for your feelings i mean i beg your pardon you know i can never express myself of course i know that said craddock oh can't i indeed said amy i dare say you think so mr noel you have always thought so meanly of me but if i can't express my meaning i am sure my father can perhaps you think you know more than he does amy said craddock for all this was so unlike herself that loving that self more than his own he scarce knew what to do with it amy dear i see what it is i suspected it all along what if you please mr noel i am not accustomed to be suspected suspected indeed miss rosedew don't be angry with me i know very well how good you are it is the last time i shall ever see you or i would not restore you this the moon being on her way towards the southeast looked over the counter like gravestone and craddock placed on the level surface the bracelet found in the wood amy knew it in a moment and she burst out crying oh poor clayton how proud he was of it 
Mr. Noel, I never could have thought this of you. Never, never, never. Thought what of me, Amy? Darling Amy, what on earth have I done to offend you? Oh, nothing. I suppose it is nothing to remind me how cruel I have been to him. Oh, no, nothing at all. And all this from you. In a storm of sobs, she fell upon Jeremy Wattle's tombstone, and Craddock put one arm around her to prevent her being hurt. Amy, you drive me wild. I have brought it to you only because it is yours, and because I am going away. Craddock, it never was mine. I refused it months ago, and I believe he gave it... You know what he was, poor dear. I believe he transferred it, and something else. Oh, no, I can't express myself. To... just to somebody else. Oh, you darling, and who was that other... What a fool he must have been! Confound it, I never meant that. I don't know, Craddock. Oh, please keep away. But I think it was Pearl Garnet. Oh, Craddock, dear Craddock, how dare you? No, I won't. Yes, I will, Crad, considering all your misery. And she put up her pure lips in the moonlight, for Craddock had got her in both arms by this time, and was listening to no reason. Her sweet lips, pledged once, pledged for ever, she put them up in her love and pity, and let him do what he liked with them. And the moon, attesting a thousand seals hourly, never witnessed one more binding. After all, Craddock Knoll, so tried of heaven, so scourged with the bitterest rods of despair, your black web of life is interwoven now with one bright thread of gold. The purest, the sweetest, the loveliest girl that ever spun happiness out of sorrow, or smile through the veil of affliction the truest and dearest of all god's children loving all things hating none pours into your heart for ever all that fount of love freed henceforth from doubt and wonder except at her own happiness enfranchised of another world enriched beyond commercial thoughts ennobled beyond self she blushed as she spoke and drew pale as she thought and who shall say which was more beautiful? Craddock could tell, perhaps, if any one can, but he only knew that he worshipped her, and to see the way she cried with joy, and how her young bosom panted, it was enough to warm old Jeremy Wattle, dead and buried nigh fourscore years. Craddock, all abroad himself, full of her existence, tasting, feeling, thinking nothing, except of her deliciousness, drew his own love round to the light to photograph her for ever. Poor Clayton was dead, else Crad would have thought that he deserved to be so, for going away to Pearl Garnet. But then the grapes were sour. How he revelled in that reflection! And yet it was very wrong of him. Amy stood up in the moonlight, not ashamed to show herself. She felt that Craddock was pouring upon her, to stereotype every inch of her, and yet she was not one atom afraid. She knew that no man ever depreciates his own property, except in the joke which is brag. It is a most wonderful thing, what girls know and what they won't know. But who cares now for reflections? Her thick hair had all fallen out of her hat, because she had been crying so. Her delicate form, still so light and girlish, leaned forward in trust of the future and the long dark lashes she raised for her lover glistened with the deep light under them shame was nestling in her cheeks the shame of growing womanhood the down on the yet ungathered fruit of love then she crept in closer to him to stop him from looking so much at her darling craddock my own dear craddock don't you know me now you see, I only love you so, because you are so unlucky, and I am so dreadfully obstinate. Of course I know all that, my pet, my beautiful, inexpressible, and remember that I only love you so, because you are such a darling. Then Amy told him how sorry she was for having been so fractious lately, and that she would never be so again, only it was all his fault, because she wanted to comfort him, and he would not come and let her. 
here the softest gleam fluttered through her tears like the mazarine blue among dewdrops and that only for the veriest chance and the saucer she had broken but what of that she would like to know it was the surest sign of good luck to them although it was the best service only for that her crad would have gone gone away for ever and never known how she loved him yes with all her heart every single atom of it every delicious one if he must know and she would keep it for him for ever for ever and be thinking of him always let him recollect that poor darling and think of his troubles no more then he told her how uncle john had behaved how nobly how magnanimously and had given every bit of money he possessed in the world for craddock to start in life with john rosedew's only child began to cry again at hearing it and put her little hand into her pocket in the simplest way imaginable yes you will dear no i won't went on for several minutes till amy nestled quite into his bosom and put her sweet lips to his ear if you don't i will never believe that you love me truly i am your little wife you know and all that i have is yours the marriage portion in debate was no more than five and sixpence for amy could never keep money long so craddock accepted the sweet little purse only he must have a bit of her hair in it she pulled out her little sewing case which she always took to the day school and the small bright scissors flashed in the moonlight and they made a great fuss over them two great snips were heard i know for exchange after all is no robbery then hand in hand they went together to see poor clayton's grave and craddock started as they approached for something black was moving there little dear said amy as the doggie looked mournfully up at them she would starve if it were not for me and i could not coax her to eat a morsel until i said clayton poor clayton and then she licked my hand and whined and took a bit to please me she has had a very nice tea tonight i told you i broke the saucer but that was all my own clumsiness and what has she got there oh god i can't stand it it is too melancholy black weena when it was dark that evening and clayton must have done dinner had stolen away to his dressing-room and fetched as she had been taught to do his smoking jacket and slippers it took her a long time to carry the jacket for fear it should be wet for him then she came with a very important air and put them down upon his grave and wagged her tail for approval she was lying there now and wondering how much longer till he would be ready craddock sobbed hysterically and amy led him softly away to the place where his travelling bag was now wait here one moment my poor dear and i will bring you your future companion presently amy came back with weena following the coat and the slippers darling craddock take her with you she is so true and faithful she will die if she is left here and she will be such a comfort to you take her craddock for my sake the last entreaty settled it craddock took the coat and slippers and carried weena a little way while she looked back wistfully at the churchyard and amy coaxed and patted her they agreed on the road that amy rosedew should call upon miss garnet to restore the bracelet and should mark how she received it for amy had now a strong suspicion especially after what craddock had seen which now became intelligible that pearl knew more of poor clayton's death than had been confessed to any one my own craddock only think said amy i have felt the strongest conviction throughout that you had nothing to do with it sweetest one he replied with a desperate longing to clasp her but for weena and the carpet-bag that is only because you love me never say it again dear suspense or even doubt about it would kill me like a slow poison amy shuddered at his tone and thought how different men were for a woman would live on the hope of it but she remembered those words when the question arose and rejoiced that he knew not the whole of it and now with the great drops in her eyes she stood at her father's gate to say good-bye to her love 
she would not let him know that she cried but weena was welcome to know it and weena licked some tears off and then quite felt for amy good-bye my own my only said cradock for the twentieth time even the latch of the gate was trembling god loves us after all amy or at any rate he loves you and you and you oh cradock if he loves one he must love both of us i believe he does said cradock since i have seen you i am sure of it now i care not for the world except my world in you dearest darling life of my life promise me not to fret again fret indeed with you to love me give me just one more cradock with a braver heart than he ever thought to own again and yet with a hole and string in it for after all he did not own it being begged away at last by the one who then went down on her knees only to beg him back again that hapless yet most blessed fellow strode away as hard as he could for fear of running back again and the dusky trees closed around him and he knew and loved every one of them then the latch of the gate for the last time clicked when he was out of sight and the laurestinus by the pier beginning to bud for the winter glistened in the moonlight with a silent storm of tears end of chapter 28 end of craddock knoll a tale of the new forest volume 1 by richard dodridge blackmore read by lynn thompson in the willamette valley